it felt free to me that I didn't have to shrink or squish myself. I have chased that ever since, <laughs> that like you were really good. I start to wonder if each character feels more like home to me than my body person home. Welcome to the Ideas of Order podcast, designed by California Closets. This is a show dedicated to answering the question, what does home mean to you? I'm Jeremiah Brent, and with the help of some of my closest friends, we are ready to open our doors to you. When was the last time that you let your imagination run free? The last time that you made space for creativity that's no one's sake but your own? I think that's the secret really to artistry. Leaving room for unboundaried thoughts and free thinking often leads to our most authentic and celebrated ideas. Visionary sparks that inspire the most redefining elements of modern life often begin here. Have you found a creative outlet that isn't bound by productivity? Today I am joined by somebody whose myriad of characters have inhabited some of the most memorable fictional landscapes of the last two decades. From her renowned roles in Boy Meets Girl, Snow Cake, and 12 Monkeys, to the Emmy Awards sweeping hit comedy series, Schitt's Creek, our guest today has given life to characters that echo and affect our world for the better. Please join me in welcoming the exceptionally wonderful and effortlessly charming actor, writer, producer, performer, and limitless inspiration, my friend, Emily Hampshire. Thank you. We're gonna have fun. I'm excited. <laughs> I kind of want to look back a little bit on the early life of Emily. You know, while developing your craft and creative sensibilities as a young actor, was there any particular space that really helped shape the trajectory of your career? It can be as literal as a physical space in a room or as broad as a mindset or a person or a community, but has there ever been a space that you look back where you really felt the most held? My space that was everything to me, and I still gravitate towards spaces like this, was the closet under the stairs when I was growing up. There was this closet under the stairs that I turned into my own home. Like my mom would throw out a paper towel rack in the garbage and I would like go secretly get it and bring it into my thing and I'd put it up and I took a scrap of carpet and put it in there and everything, I did in there was imagination and that's what I work with now so much. But also I have um, recordings of it because one Christmas I got like a tape recorder and I have this recording of me like running up the stairs and then going into the upstairs closet and like singing The Little Mermaid at the top of my lungs. Like I would always go into closets. <laughs> so um, that first one was everything to me. What did it look like inside? If I think of it now, the door was probably really short. It was like white wood cupboard, I guess, not really a closet. And like the door opens and then inside of it, it's basically what under stairs would look like if they weren't finished or anything. So it wasn't ever supposed to be exposed. It was just like a storage space. What did you love the most about it? That it was just yours? You had a complete autonomy in there? That it was just mine. I do have this particular thing with making my own home. Like aside from that space, we also had a shed in the backyard that I drew intricate plans. I think my mom might still have them to make it into my own home. And I tried to buy it off my mother. I <laughs> tried to negotiate, she wouldn't sell it to me, but I remember having dreams of getting running water in there. That was like a big thing I thought about for days and when you're little, days is long. There was something about wanting to be on my own and like have my own space. And it, it did progress through my life. Like I moved out at 
16. And I mean, I lived with roommates sometimes, but for the most part, I've had my own space, maybe because nobody can live with me because I'm such a disaster. (laughs) It's always interesting to me, that question of the first space, because it's never really what you imagine, but it's always really interesting how much that space informs where you are now and how you live now. So I love that for you, it was underneath that staircase and a space that you could have your own. So it's always been about autonomy and the opportunity for you to create something that was specifically for you. Yeah, and I do think a small space too, because now if I think of the spaces I love the most now is, this sounds terrible, but- No, I love it, give it to me. A pod in a plane, like a real nice pod. (laughs) There's nothing I like more than that kind of contained, and I never feel better like that. I don't actually like big spaces at all. I feel like I don't know what to do. First of all, I also live for a pod, so I'm here for you and I support you. But I felt the same way. You know, we, at one point, we had a house that was big and and I just remember feeling really untethered to it. You know, I don't like not utilizing things in the house or walking around and feeling like I'm participating with everything in the house. It just never felt right. Oh, that is such a good word, untethered. Because that is exactly it, like free floating in the thing. But when I'm in a smaller space that's contained, I do feel solid. I wanted to go back and talk to you a little bit about how you got into acting in your profession. I know that at age 11, you said that there was a performance of Les Miserables that inspired you to become an actor, obviously apart from the clear you know, emotional mastery of storytelling. You know, what was it about that particular Les Mis performance that spoke to you? I think it was, I'd never seen something that made me feel like that, like made me feel like I left the earth. And in retrospect, when I think about it, there's something about musicals and about when you're singing that is very emotional in a way that I don't feel like people can be necessarily in life. There was this Schitt's Creek episode where we did the musical cabaret and Stevie- Mm -hmm. I remember. (laughs) And Stevie (laughs) sang maybe this time and like, Stevie would never be thought of to emote or to have any kind of real feeling. But through a song, I felt like this was my opportunity to give her the voice to say her truth without any kind of um, squishing it. And that's what I think the musical did for me. I was brought up very like, children should be seen and not heard and like be polite and don't get emotional about anything or don't get them angry about that. And so I think the fact that emotions were exploding through song on the stage was something that just took me. That's so interesting. So you see the Miss, something happens and sparks it. Where did you go from there? How did you decide that this is what you wanted to do? Well, you know, I went to high school and in high school they had the acting whatever thing after school and I did a play and I was cast as a really small part and it wasn't really anything, but my high school vice principal came up to me after the first performance of that, like came up to me unsolicited and said, you were really good. You were really funny. And that was honestly it for me. I was like, I have chased that ever since (laughs) that like, you were really good. (laughs) You were, (laughs) that is. And from that point on, I really did I mean, I literally wrote a contract with myself that I would only have one hour a day of non-acting activities and everything else would I would highlight entire books. And I just was very single-minded from that point on. I love that. Does it make you happy still? It does in a different way that I always have to go back and remind myself like, how happy I was when I got my first audition. I was so excited and I was so excited to go into it. And then there came a period of time later in my life where uh, the thought of getting an audition was a nightmare. And like I'd break out in hives and I recently been going to schools and stuff and talking to teenagers and in performing arts programs and stuff. and they always want to show me something. Like they always want to do a performance or show me something they've done. And that 
is something I need to get back in a way of the joy of showing. I think I became very scared of that because to me it was, you're going to be judged. But like when you're young, I don't think you've felt that yet. And so you just have this pure desire to like show yourself in a way that doesn't have all the baggage of like, what are people going to think? Will they think I'm arrogant because I'm showing my thing? Will they hate me because I get the lead? Will they think I'm bad? Like all those things. So a lot of my acting life now is trying to remind myself of being a beginner. Now, I wanted to kind of just jumping off that question, ask you, you know, if there is a character or if there have been characters where you felt the most at home in performing them, you know, and if these characters or the experience of them like shaped or affected your life moving forward in any way? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, and Thanks. I start to wonder if each character feels more like home to me than this home, which is, this is my body person home. I did a, a show called 12 Monkeys that was based on the movie 12 Monkeys. And I played the Brad Pitt part in that. And he is a... He's complicated. Complicated. He's complicated. Let's just call him layered. Layered. Um, yes. And so I played Jennifer Goins and what felt so liberating and at home about being in that character was that I could do anything. Like nothing was out of the bounds of what was right for that person. Cause she would one day wants to be a CEO of the company and then she's the CEO and then she wants to start a gang and go back to the 1920, it was a time travel show. So it just, it felt free to me that I didn't have to shrink or squish myself. And like Stevie, I, I normally refer to Stevie as somebody where I would take a vacation from myself in Stevie because she's very chill, cool, calm. And I'm unfortunately not like that. <laughs> and I think when people meet me and like say, Stevie, I get more excited than them. And then they're weirded out. And, <laughs> and so I would wish I was like Stevie, but I'm not. And so that's where I feel like I can go and hide out in Stevie and like not stress as much, but it doesn't feel like home as much as Jennifer did. Can you let go of these people when you're not playing them? I feel like I've been so lucky that I've gotten characters that I feel like give me something. Even when I'm done playing them, I have been left with the remnants of a person who affected my life, kind of like a friend who's changed you. And I feel that way with um, definitely Stevie and Jennifer, especially because that was such a period of time in my life where I was doing Schitt's Creek and I also did that uh, 12 Monkeys and they never overlapped. But then the last season they did overlap. And so I would shoot Schitt's during the day and 12 Monkeys at night. And a lot of people have asked, like, how do you switch from those characters? But from for me, they were so different, but such polar opposite sides of myself that it was actually easy to do. And I got to express both those sides. And when it was over, I did feel like the postpartum of that. I felt like I lost my best friend, everything. I, it felt like when I quit smoking, which sounds terrible, but it felt like that. No, that makes sense. <laughs> like there's a void. Yeah. Yeah. Reflecting on this like last decade of your career. How have your spaces grown to evolve with you when we talk through personal evolution and creative evolution, you know, and how do the spaces that hold you today resonate with you today? So 
I mean, just on a real basic level, economically, the spaces that I was in before was the spaces that I could afford. And well, I lived in downtown LA for most of my life. And before that in Toronto, I lived in an equivalent to downtown LA, Queen and Sherburne in Toronto. And I always chose an apartment that I cared about the design, that it wasn't just this cookie cutter thing. I always cared about character and stuff. And so even in choosing things that I could afford, it needed for me to be, have something special about it and not just something that every other apartment looks like. And I feel like that has stuck with me. I also feel like I've learned so many lessons from being a first time buyer of a home. It has actually been one of the greatest things because I was looking for my first house in LA and I put offers on so many houses. Like each one I found that I loved, I was like already moving in, buying stuff for it, adding stuff to cart. And then somebody came in with all cash and like, I didn't get it. But then when I found my house that I now have, I was like, thank God, I didn't get all those houses. Can you tell me and tell everybody listening just what it was about the house that made you fall in love? You know, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What makes it special? So what I loved about it was I was looking at all these homes and I wanted to find a beautiful place, but a small place. And that's actually hard to find beautiful and small. I kept finding these like four bedroom places that, and I don't want a family. Like I really am a lone wolf and I wanted my bedroom and I didn't want to have guests. <laughs> so that is one of the things I loved about it was that it's got one primary bedroom with an ensuite bathroom and it's got this courtyard. And then downstairs, it has an office that you have to go outside to get to, which I really loved because I've started writing a lot and the idea of going somewhere to work feels great. Like when I didn't have, a, I would check into a hotel to be able to write, to just get out of my space. And so I loved that. And I also loved that it had this other house on it that was also a one bedroom that I thought, if anything happens, I can rent that out. And then ultimately my dream was to make that into an office space and have a compound. And But what I have found that really stresses me out is all the things that come with like, the windows are leaking, the roof is the, the, the septic tank. The, the. And I did start to think, I'm like, I want to go back to when I just went into an Airbnb and it wasn't mine and it was, I didn't have to worry about it. And I do think the place I feel most at home is a hotel. Well, I mean, the house sounds amazing. Why do you think with all this potential and finally having a place to put down roots, why do you still feel at home in a hotel? Well, so I haven't put down any roots in there, really. I literally moved in and took my stuff from my loft downtown. It was furnished with that. And it's been in boxes. I've had other people live there. And then when I am there, I'm there for like a couple of months and I don't feel like I should get it set up because I'm just going to leave. And, and so I haven't made it mine at all yet. We got to change that. I know. I don't even have anything on the walls. Like, not even... Why? We have to make it that little nook underneath the stairs again oh. for you. You know, and the crazy thing is I would just venture to guess just your personality type that those small moments of intimacy that tether you to where you're at right now will be transformative with the way you move through the world. Because right now, it doesn't you have to feel transactional. I mean, you, you're, it's crazy. You feel... Right now, the way you describe it is that you feel comfortable in a hotel, which is core transactional because you're probably always on the go. Even when you said intimacy, that like scared me. <laughs> the <laughs> intimacy of like, I think I am afraid of the attachment to a home. I've also found that I'm scared it will take away from me working if I start to spend time like loving it, decorating it, do it like <laughs> if I get comfortable, but I need to. I also don't understand why 
most of my best friends are in the design space somehow. I don't know how this happened. <laughs> and I am, I mean, people have threatened to submit me for hoarders. Like, I am a problem. No, you don't have a problem. It's, it makes sense. It's like, I feel like you've been in this constant momentum and this growth and this change and this evolution and you're doing and moving and changing, putting down roots though. Yeah. I mean, when you talk through what mattered to you most, which was a space that was the physical manifestation of, you know, what mattered to you, I think it's going to be transformative. I'm an intervention. <laughs> <laughs> The completion of your most recent film, The Ends of Sex, and jumping into you know some of your upcoming projects, Self Reliance and Bloody Hell, creating balance for you now in your day, I am assuming can be a full time job in and of itself. So through all that chaos, how do you find time for yourself to kind of disconnect and recenter? Have you found a way to create space for just you? Do you meditate? Is there a morning routine? You know, what's your ritualistic touchstone, so to speak, that grounds you? So I got an Olympic-sized trampoline. <laughs> I found that jumping, like bouncing, is the only thing that can get me out of my head, no matter what. Because I'm always thinking of, oh my God, I haven't done this thing. I haven't done that. Oh, I have to do this. I have to. And the minute I start bouncing, I'm just like, it's pure joy. And so I actually have a trampoline in every single city. Because honestly, if you're in like the horse mood or you're like crying, if you get on a trampoline and start bouncing, like your mood changes. I don't know if it's brain chemistry or something like it's physiological, like you, it changes. So that's the one thing I, oh, and boxing. I started boxing. Oh my God. Good for you. Boxing is so hard. I did not realize, and I didn't even want to do it. I thought it was going to be like boxer size, but I found this guy, he does like one-on-one -on -one sessions and he numbers the punches and so you've got to really think like it's a real mind workout and so i can't think of all the things i need to do while i'm boxing as we kind of move through the present day and continue to look forward into what's to come in terms of space and home career and even mindset you know what do you imagine is the most imperative for future emily i think i intellectually know that it needs to be feeling good not working cuz i don't really have fun having fun like to hang is so weird to me when it doesn't have a purpose. Um, if it's your birthday or if you need something, I'm going to be there. But like thinking in terms of spaces to relax in, <laughs> that is something I'm uncomfortable with. And I think I need to figure out, like, especially knowing that the minute you said intimacy in space, <laughs> I wanted to run. <laughs> I think I'm afraid of attachment of some kind. And yeah. that is why I can see now that I really don't let myself make the space my own anymore, which I've been trying to do with this reno with my cottage, but I'm afraid of it a bit. Like, because then I'm investing in it and I'm going to care and, yeah. And then it's you. Yeah. <laughs> Is there um, a hope for how your home will evolve in the future? Yes. I mean, I really want it to be ultimately a, a work-live space. Like, I'd like my home to just be more how I would actually like it. Like, if you came into my house right now, I would be... Somebody else unpacked boxes and put stuff up that I don't like the way it looks like that. And, but I'm so I don't feel like it reflects who I am. <laughs> the only thing in there that reflects who I am is I did get a lazy boy chair that I call grandpa and I scrawled grandpa on it because it's so ugly, but it's so comfortable. <laughs> oh my God. I have such a visual picture of that room right now. And it does not look like you to me. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I'd love the other house to be an office for a production company. And But I'd also love to just, my cottage feels like the place I always want to go if I have a break, except it's like destroyed right now. It's demolished and it's very traumatic to me. Where's the cottage at again? It's in Ontario, in Buckhorn, Ontario. So it's on a lake and that is the first space that I feel like I want all my stuff to be here. I could, like I want to come here and spend holidays here. And yeah, it makes me feel like a kid again in the way that like in Canada, it's very cottage country and you don't have to have like a ton of money to be able to go to the cottage. You can rent out people's cottages and you jump in the lake off the dock. And it's something that like I was so nostalgic for. So I love that about it. My biggest hope for you, Emily, is that you have a space that reflects like the beauty that you've given to other people through what you've provided. Because I think there's a lot of people that have watched your work and have felt your love and, you know, through your characters, but you deserve a space that provides that for you too, because it really will change everything for you. I know intimacy stresses you the hell out, but that's that's going to be the name of, it's going to be an intimacy full on like crew that comes in oh and we're going to do God. that thing, but find a way to tether you to your space. You know what's so funny? I invented a word that I'm trying to get into the dictionary called distimacy <laughs> because I feel like I can be very intimate with this distance. Oh my God. I'm going <laughs> to cling to you like a koala bear after this. We're going to break it all down. Oh, I love you. We've reached the part of the show where we get a little bit cozier and a little bit more candid. I like to imagine that there's like a beautiful fire crackling behind us. And I just want to ask you a couple more questions. At Ideas of Order, we have a lot to say about the concept of comfort and growth, both in the home and in life. So for this fireside tete-a-tete, just a few quick fire questions to dig a little deeper. You ready? Okay. Yeah, I love a tete-a-tete. What has home taught you? Uh... <laughs> This is perfect. I feel my tete tete is gonna be so traumatic. I know. I love it. It's traumatic. Oh, home, uh, home has taught me. Uh, home is where the suitcase is. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what it taught me. <laughs> what is the most surprising space that you have ever loved? I think it's that closet. I think it's actually a cupboard. A cupboard under the stairs in my childhood home. I loved that space. I would actually move back in there right now. <laughs> <laughs> when do you feel the most at home? When I check into a hotel. I'm the worst, I'm the worst. <laughs> no, this is perfect. There's no excuse for you not to come to New York then and visit. You hate intimacy, but we'll make it real. I'll stand on the other side of the room when you come over. Okay, okay? perfect. <laughs> I'm so grateful you're doing this, and I'm also got a real bee in my bonnet about getting this group of people together to make sure that you live a beautiful life because you deserve it. Thank you for having me. I love you so much. <laughs> While much of our lives are rooted in home, our joy, creativity, and imagination follow us wherever we go. And no matter where you are or whatever unlikely place you find yourself in, please remember that you carry with you the tools for ingenuity and the tools for change. Our imaginations are limitless when we give them the time and space. Join me on our next episode where I chat with design expert and cultural curator, Wendy Goodman, about the loss in leaving a love space and good design as a tool for shaping the future of culture. For more Ideas of Order, please visit ideasoforder.com or californiaclosets.com. I'm Jeremiah Brent. You guys, thank you so much for being here today, and we'll see you again soon. I'm not a, a typical Virgo in the sense of... I live with a Virgo. I know what you're in for. <laughs> Nate's a triple Virgo. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Another Everything Podcast production. Visit everythingpodcast.com. Subscribe wherever you